Good morning. My name is Mike LeClaire. I'm the pastor of Living Hope Church. I'm honored to be in that position. I'm blessed to be in that position. I'm exhausted by the position. <laughs> but I'm uplifted today. And it's all because of what God does in each of us. He's called to use us all in, in this type of way where we go out and serve him. If you look at your bulletin, you'll see the, the one announcement I want to give you is the bad weather announcement. We're in that season. Check the bulletin here. See what it says. But if the public schools call off school, we're off. I don't know what that does for today, but that works for the rest of the week. Do we have a plan in place for Sundays? Check the website. Who said that? Justin? Check the website. That was brilliant. And if you come here and there's nobody here, make a snow fort, sit down and worship right where you're at in the parking lot. That'll be fine. We're coming to the end of the year. And if you want your tithes and offerings to count for your taxes this year, that should not be a motivation for giving. But if, if you want that to happen, you can get your stuff in before the 28th, I believe, um, for whatever that's worth to you. Tithing isn't about the tax benefit we get. Tithing is what we're called to do, Amen. to give back to God what he requires us to give. It's an act of submission, and it's an act of, uh, of worship, and it's a way for he to bless us because we can't outgive God, the Bible tells us. So, at that, do I have Pastor Donnie? Here we are. Can you come forward, Pastor Donnie? Here we are. Advent season. Amen. So along with Advent, we all should be preparing for Christmas. What an awesome day is coming. From Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 3 through 5, it says, It's the voice of somebody shouting, Clear the way, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight pathway through the wasteland for our God. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. From Romans chapter 15 and verses 4 through 13, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promise to be fulfilled. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for the followers of Jesus Christ. And then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise, giving glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other, just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promise he made to their ancestors. He also came so that Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, for this, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. In another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people of the earth. And in another place, Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come, and he will rule over the Gentiles. And they will place their hope in him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. And then you will overflow with confidence, hoping through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you prepare for Christmas and all that God has in store for you this year, be challenged. Be challenged to prepare for all that is in store in the following ways. Number one, don't allow the stress of Christmas season to distract you from what is really important. Spend more time with your family. Simplify your life. Be still. Listen to God's voice. As it says in Hebrews 12, too, keep our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. Notice God's hand. Reflect on the past year. Perhaps you, like many, have faced perhaps financial difficulty. Maybe uh, you've escaped uh, danger or disease through an unforeseen miracle. 
Perhaps this year, this time has been of suffering for you. How has God carried you through all of these things? Remember what Joseph said way back in the Old Testament? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good. Ask God to give you direction. A man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord determines his step. God has a plan for each one. Mary and Joseph understood an amazing mission, or undertook an amazing mission, on the way to Bethlehem. And it certainly must have strengthened their bond as they conquered many obstacles and challenges along the way. There's nothing more powerful than a person, a couple, a family, a church, rallying around a cause. And as we wait and prepare for the arrival of Christmas this year, let us immerse ourselves in the excitement of what's God's plan for us and for this church for this coming year. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Donnie. A great pastor, mentor to many, myself included, of the deacons, and a great first baseman on the church softball team 40 years ago. <laughs> Remember those days, Donnie? What a, what, a great, what a great guy. The Word of God from Genesis, chapter 37, verse 12, if you're able no, I'll tell you what, don't stand up today. It's a lo we got a long one, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just thank God for his word this morning while we're seated. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, Here I am. Then he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks, and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? So he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding the flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit, and we, will sh and we shall say, Some wild beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass, when Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his clothes. 
And he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a goat, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and his, all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, and he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Heavenly Father, we give great thanks for your word, Father, that enlightens us. It speaks to us so clearly. Uh, Father, you, you speak to us in ways sometimes that are, we, we don't understand, but, but we are grateful that you do. And as you speak through your servant this morning, our pastor, God, enlighten us, Father. Help us to understand more that we might draw closer to you and each other, Father, and use your word for your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Joe. If you're in a life group, you know that that was only part of the work for this week, don't you? Well, that's the story, and we needed to get the story laid out to be able to talk about the rest of what's going on in this body of work. God is always at work. Know that. God is in control. Always. Know that. And God is good. Know that. He's good all the time. That's right. He's at work in tough times and in trials. And you're going to see here just how he's at work as this uh, plays out in Scripture. Genesis 37.1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. It's really the history of Israel. As we know, his name was changed, right? This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpath his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. I can't think of a better prescription for messing up a family than what we read right here. This is, in my eye, and I went off on this a little bit in life group, this is the most dysfunctional family that I've ever seen. And God says, I'm going to take this dysfunctional, messed up, didn't listen to me, family, and I'm going to build my kingdom. I'm going to build my church through these birds. That's what he's saying. He's going he's to build his church through this. So why am I so down on this? Or why am I making such a big deal? He fell in love. Was it Rachel? Okay, you stay with me now. You're going to help me through this. He fell in love with Rachel. That was the woman he wanted. Remember, he went a couple weeks ago, he went to Laban's. His uncle Laban, he fell, falls in love with Rachel. He gets tricked and he has to marry Leah. You remember that? And how frustrating it was. And it went over a period of time that all this stuff took place. And then the women start competing with one another. Right? They want to give him the most kids because that will make him love them more, so they think. So what does he do? He does what... <laughs> He, he does what he does. He does what a guy who doesn't listen to the Holy Spirit does. And the wives contrive to have him be with their maidservants. And he sleeps with them. And in this story right here, we see that the maidservants' kids are working with the kids of his one true love, which is Rachel, which is Joseph and Benjamin. That's, the, that's the, the backdrop to this. So here's Joseph, and he is talking to his brothers, knowing that his brothers come from Billah, a maidservant, 
and Zilpath, another maidservant, who become wives. I want to say this from the beginning. In the Old Testament, we see this all the time, polygamy. And we somehow think that it's okay at a level because it happened with the saints of the church, the guys that started the, the church. Abraham didn't trust God, so he is with his maidservant based on his wife's suggestion, and they have Ishmael. Ishmael is not the line that God had chosen for Abraham. He didn't trust God. So later, he's blessed with a son from his true wife, Sarah, and I understand what his complication was. It was a lack of faith in believing what God said because his wife, Sarah, was 90 years old. So I understand on that level. That's a flesh level of understanding. But on a spiritual level under, of understanding, he should hear from God. He should listen to what God is telling him. He should trust what God says. So the consequence of that line of thinking is where we are today in this story. We have to trust what God says. Where, how do we know what he says? Well, there's two ways. By his word. This is a Bible-believing church. We've been a Bible-believing church since the foundation of it. The pastor that started this church, Pastor Jim Erickson, he began a message with good morning, and that was the last English words he said that weren't of the Bible. And he gave scripture after scripture, and he might say, Sally, isn't that right? Or Tracy, isn't that so? And it would go scripture after scripture after scripture. When you came home, you were fed. I was a beginner in those days, a new believer, really. I came out of a, out of a church that had um, a, a strong liturgy, and I, I would, you like that? I use that word? I'm pretty impressive. Liturgy. I don't even know what it is. I use it. <laughs> Pastor Donnie was from another church that came with a strong liturgy. And we came into this not knowing the word of God, really. We had an idea. We heard some scriptures throughout, but we did not know the word of God. But as I grew in this church, the pastor that preached the word of God, that word began to, to speak to me, and it began to change me. And it was good for me. It grew me in my faith. It grew me to a place where I could trust God better and better and better as I heard it more and more and more. And then as I began to read it more and more and more, I began to know him more and more. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the living word. All right, so... Here they are. They're in this place. And now you got this young brother, one of the younger ones, second youngest, with all these half-brothers, and they hate him. And he doesn't know enough to not shuddy. So, first thing I want you to know is God does not allow or want polygamy. That's not his plan. His plan goes back to Genesis chapter 2. He made the male and female. They're joined together. The two become one flesh. Not three flesh, not five flesh, not seven flesh. They become one flesh. That was his plan from the beginning. There's no Ten Commandments at this time, but this is the moral law that he established right out of the gate for mankind. All right? So he's with his half-brothers. And then it goes on to say this. Now Israel, remember his name used to be Jacob. God changed it to Israel. Israel. Loved Joseph more than all his other children. What's he doing? Why would he say, I love this one more than all the rest? And then put the young one with them who hate him because they're loved less than the brother. I don't know why. Not smart. But God's going to build his church through him. He's going to bring us to him through this line right here. So, he loves Joseph more than his other children because he was the son of his old age. Okay, so he's an old man having children with the one that he loved, which is Rachel, and it's Jacob and it's Benjamin. I'm, I'm sorry, Joseph and Benjamin. All right. Then he makes him a tunic. It was probably neon green. <laughs> and all kinds of multicolor. It, boo. And it had sleeves, which means in those days, if you had sleeves on your tunic, that means you're not working. That means you have a position. The laborers had to cut off the sleeves and grind it out. 
His dad makes the coat for him, but not the others. That's, that's, a, that's a disaster. Do you ever say to your kids, well, you're my favorite and we just happen to have you, or I'm sorry, you were a mistake. We didn't plan on this one, but this is what happened. You know, we can laugh and joke about it, but those kind of comments could kill a kid spiritually. No, there, we planned. We planned to have 13 kids. Yeah, no, no, that was in the plan. This is what we wanted. But when his brothers saw that he, their father favored him more than all their brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. All right? The father has set the tone, a really bad tone. But you know what? God is going to be at work in the midst of this regardless of what man does. When he chooses to use you, he will use you. My suggestion is join him in the work that he's doing through you. You can fight him all you want. It's not going to go well. Join him in this work. That's why I'm standing up here. I joined him in this work. I still think I could be playing for the Maplewood Mets, beating the Colberg Braves over in the Door County League where Pastor Donnie was the founding father. Print and air. <laughs> now, Joseph had a dream. Oh, this is the next thing to add to the dysfunction of this family. Joseph had a dream. That's not, this is not good. This is awesome, but it's not good. So when he had this dream and he told his brothers that they hated him even more. So he told them of the dream. Bad move him. God didn't tell him to tell the dream. God gave him the dream because he's going to do something with it. They were being, and the dream went like this. They were binding sheaves in the field. Sheaves are like stalks of wheat. They bound together, okay? They tie them together. Then behold, his sheaf arose and stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves all stood around and bowed down to my sheaf. So what's going on here? He has 11 brothers. There's him. And he has these stalks or these sheaves. And this is the dream that he had. And he's telling them this dream. And that he is in the middle. And they're all around him. And he's standing upright and proud. And those sheaves are bowing before him. Remember, he's the second youngest. If that doesn't get you a butt whooping, I don't know what's going to get you one with brothers. Can you imagine? But that's what happened. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more. Of course they did. For his dreams and his words. God will take this. And God will use this for his glory and for his purposes. It seems like a funny story and we can make fun of it, but it's a miserable story and it's beautiful at the same time because God, I believe, responds. He responds through us. His plan is probably grander than what we are, but he chooses to use us. The broken, the defiled, the messed up, the, the, the proud and he will break us, and he will mold us, he will shape us, but he will use us even before we're ready to be used. Amen. Why? Because he's God. Why else? Because he wants to. And he will use you, and he will use me. I could give you a list of my mistakes, and we'd be here a while. But he's using me regardless. I know people in the different ministries of the church that are poured into their, their ministry, and if you heard their story, every step of the way, you say, ooh, that person's a hot mess. Yeah, they probably were, but God chose to use them. And then, after he chooses to use us, he does this thing that's, that's so beautiful. He gets us to buy into what he's doing. And he gets us excited about what he's doing. And then we find that there's actually joy in being used by God to accomplish his purpose. There is joy in it. And if there's not joy... He's probably still rubbing off some rough edges. But when God calls you, I say, step into the middle of it. And you're not going to want to. But step into the middle of it and join him in what he's doing. He's going to grow you up and he's going to raise you and he's going to send you out. I've, I think I've shared this before. I remember we were on a retreat with the youth advisors. At this time, I was teaching in a middle school and I was also 
working with the youth group. No position or anything like that, just working with the youth group, which means playing foosball and volleyball and basketball and beating up on teenagers and just having a blast. It was the greatest thing in the world. And then we went on a retreat for the advisors. Joe and Jane, you two were there, I remember. They're old. And at this, and at this retreat, Pastor Jerry said, Mike, can you do the uh, devotional? And I was thinking, no. I don't know how to do a devotional. Oh, you just, here's what it is. This is the material here. So you just go do it. No, I can't do it. I was sweating. I was nervous. And I don't think I made one sentence that was coherent. And the whole thing, I was embarrassed. Then I remember as I was growing in my faith, I was a teacher at Washington Middle School. And, and I had interactions with kids. That's what you do as a teacher. And I had tough kids. And so they're tough interactions. And, but I really cared about them. And I would share my faith with them. And when I did, uh, it was pretty, it, was, it, was, it made me feel good, especially when they responded. And uh, I came back, came to Wednesday night. I said, oh, Jerry, I had this cool thing happen with this one kid at, at school. And I told him this story. And he said, oh, you need to share that. With who? With the group. I'm not talking in front of those teenagers. There's probably 35 kids there. I'm not talking in front of them. No, you need to share this. It was a good thing. I stammered and I stuttered and I couldn't get hardly a word out. I was never so embarrassed. I was a teacher. I'm used to being in front of kids. But under this circumstance, when it's a spiritual thing, it's a different game. And I couldn't hardly get the words out and I was embarrassed. I felt so not qualified to do what God is calling me to do bit by bit. And you know what he did? He showed me grace, and he grew me up before my own eyes. To do what? To do what he's asking me to do. And he's doing that right here in this story. He's grown up these brothers, and he's grown up this particular brother for an amazing work that affects you and I to this day. And it's going to affect you and I eternally. And it's going to affect the Jew God's chosen people, don't let that bother you. Be excited about it eternally as well. God is at work. And even when it doesn't look like he's at work, he's at work. We mess things up, he is at work in them. We mess them up so bad, he uses you regardless. Why? Because he chose to use you. Tim, he chose you to work at Abel. He chose you to be the executive pastor of this church. He chose you for those things. Kathy, he chose you. He chose you for his purposes, for his glory, for his honor, to use you in your giftings. Joe, he chose you. Right before he chose Jane, he chose you. And none of us came into this thing perfect. But he's shaping us and he's growing us and he's molding us for the things to come. You heard Mike speak that we're in a day. You can feel it getting closer and closer. Something's happening. The spirit of God is moving. The world is moving, but the wrong way. It's crazy days that we live in. It's unlike what I've experienced before. I get snippets and pieces and bits of it throughout time. But I'm seeing converging things like I've never seen before. That's exciting. And it's frightful at the same time. It makes me care about those I love. It makes me care about those who have fallen away from God. Do you care about the people in your life who have fallen away from God? That's a question. If I had time, I'd ask each one to share share what you're feeling. Share what you're feeling about those that you love that you think you need to share something with. Share. What's holding you back from sharing? Or maybe it's somebody in your workplace. Maybe it's somebody, God is calling you to share something with them because we are in a day and the days are short. Second thing, God is in control. He is controlling the narrative. We think we're controlling the narrative. He's controlling the narrative. And he does it in the midst of anger. He does it in the midst of discord. I'm going to get back to the story. Verse 9. Then he dreams still another dream. The guy hasn't learned anything. He dreams another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. 
Well, he went a little too far because his parents were there. And they said, you mean that your brothers, my wife, and I are going to bow down before you? Yeah, isn't it great? It wasn't great for them. It will be later, and you'll see how that goes. This picture, this is a powerful picture that God's given us here of Joseph's dream, speaks to the salvation of his brothers. And we'll know, and we're going to get more from Pastor Tim next week about this, but it speaks to the brothers and the salvation of this family. That's what happens. The ones who, who abused him, the ones who wanted to kill him based on the story that Joe read, based on that story, they wanted to kill him, they wanted to be done with him, they, were, they hated him to that point. God was going to use the brothers to bring about the very prophetic word that he gave to the one they were abusing. And he was going to be like a savior to them. When the famine comes, when the tough times come, there's no food anywhere, and they're hauled off to Egypt, where after they got rid of their brother, he ends up in that place. You, re- you heard the story? It's very interesting. But this isn't the great prophecy given in this story. It's a great prophecy. There's a greater prophecy. Because the the story isn't through Joseph, to be really honest with you. He gets all the glam in this story. He gets all the attention. But the story is Judah. Judah is the line from which our Savior is going to come. He is the line that will not just save his people, but all people. How many times did you hear Pastor Donnie say the word Gentile in your thing? Donnie, 15 times, I swear. 15 times he said Gentile. When he uses that word Gentile, he is talking to us. We are Gentiles. And there is something in this faith for the Gentile, believe me. In fact, this whole age that we're living in right now, it's called the church age, is for the Gentile. And when does this age come to an end? When the fullness of the Gentiles come in, who are the other Gentiles? Your families, your friends, your peers. Anybody who is not Jewish is a Gentile. And God has given us a couple thousand years to reap a harvest of the Gentiles. That's the church age, and that's what's happening right now. He's calling the church. He's calling people to the church. And he's he's going to call the church to himself, I believe, sooner than later. That's my personal opinion. What do you believe? Do you believe that that's something you can shelf for a while and not worry about it? I know that game. I've done it for most of my life. Don't, Don't play that game. Went to a beautiful funeral yesterday. I said beautiful because it was a celebration. It was a celebration because the man that died was a man of God. And it's very clear. And our own Peter Falk did his father's eulogy, and he was off the chain amazing. Why was he so amazing? Because this is stuff he spoke to his family all the time. What's his family like? They're believers. He's got a boatload of kids. His dad had 15 kids. He spoke to all of them. And I heard a family who loves God. And Peter is a strong force in his family, sharing the gospel with his family. The Bible tells us that a prophet is not welcome in his own home. Okay, that's true. That was for Jesus. When we operate in the prophetic, we're not welcome in our home either. That doesn't mean we shuddy. That means we say something. We tell the truth. We we tell them about who Christ is because it means everything. And when somebody in your family comes to Christ, that should light a fire in you like it does with me. I got a whole family telling me, praying for me every day. How wonderful is that? I know what they're praying. Mike, we pray for you every day. Yeah, that I come back to the Catholic Church. That's their prayer for me. <laughs> you know what I love about it? They're praying for me. And they care. God will sift out that prayer. Right. <laughs> but know this, that the prophecy goes through Judah. Is Judah better than Joseph? Hardly. It's interesting that We read chapters 37 and 39, and we skip over 38. 38 talks about Judah. Judah was a whoremonger. I'm not not being funny. This is true. This is what the Bible says. And he gets caught in a scheme 
by his daughter-in-law. And things happen with her. And now there's a responsibility that comes because of the behavior he demonstrated with her who played the harlot. That's Judah. Yet God chose to use Judah to be the line with which Christ would come. Can you imagine? Do you think he could use you? Do you think he could use me? I never pulled a stunt like that. It's weird. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's sin. But he chose to use them. Why? Because God will use who he will use. And he will show himself to who he will show himself. And our response is to respond to him with a yes, Lord. Or a, I need you, Lord. Or save me, Lord. Or bring me home, Lord. And he'll do that for you. Save my family, Lord, is the next one. Genesis 49, 8 says, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse him. And then verse 10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh. Shiloh means to the one whom it belongs, which is God, which is Jesus. All right? Until Shiloh comes. And to him, that's Jesus, shall be the obedience of the people. It's through Judah. Jesus is called to and referred to as the lion from the tribe of Judah. I believe that when I die and I enter through one of the 12 gates, I think it's the Judah gate because the only reason why I'm going at all is because of the lion of the tribe of Judah, because of what he has done. He did it for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. I'm going back. We're in the age of the Gentile right now, the church age. And the time is short because after this, when he's done, he's done with the Gentile, he now moves on to his chosen people, the ones he chose to bring the promises and the covenants through, and that's the Jew. And the next seven years will be about the Jew. We're coming to that place, I believe. And it's not, and, and by the way, I'm going to say it with this, with this uh, cover. Every generation since the time of Paul has said the same thing, <laughs> that they believe that God is coming back in their day. But never before has the table been set like it is today. Amen. The prophetic table has been set. Right. And to me, the big tell is, in five minutes, everybody in the world can hear what's happening in Israel right now. Yeah. It doesn't take any time. And we are current with what's going on there. And prophetically speaking, everything is about Israel. Yeah. And it's going to be especially about Israel once God calls the church home. But when you hear the, the things coming from Gog and Magog and Tobalt and Meshach, you're hearing about what's happening at the end. And that's exactly what's happening. When you look at those names that I just mentioned, they, re, they refer to countries like Russia, like Turkey, all right? Like the Middle East, like the Far East, who can contrive a, an army of 200 million. Coming where? Coming against Israel. To what? To wipe them out. Why? Because they are the apple of God's eye. And to be very honest, they hate God. They hate God as we know God. They hate God as the Jews know God. They hate God for the fact that Christ was a Jew. Do they love gods? Yes. They have their own gods. But it's not the living God. It is not Jesus Christ. It is not his Holy Spirit, the triune God. It's fabricated gods. It's deviated gods. And that's what's happening in the world today. And this is on par with that. So the greater prophecy isn't that the, that, that the brothers were saved and the family and the dad were saved. That's awesome. The greater fulfillment is what Jesus did and who he saved. The one from the lion of the tribe of Judah will save mankind for those that will receive him and invite him in. You should get excited about that. I, I, I don't want to hype you up or anything, but man. Revelation 5.5 5 says, 
But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open up the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Wow. It is all about Christ. I want you to think to yourselves, this is a personal thought that you'll process. Do you believe this stuff? I said it was personal. You can say yes if you want. <laughs> I'm kidding. Do you believe this? And then if you do, what is your response to this? Is it to carry on in your Christian lethargy? Or is it to be challenged by what the Spirit of God is saying, I got to move, I got to do this. I've been lethargic for too long. I have to, I have to move. I know how hard, how hard this is to hear because every one of us in this room is convicted at one level or another. It's just a matter of degrees. But there's a call right now. And I think the joy that the believer will find in these days that we're in now is when we step into that place and we be about his business because it's for his glory. I said before, and it was funny, and I'll say it again, but if you don't know how to begin, go to people you don't like. Practice on them. Share the gospel. You got nothing to lose. But when I say that, you move to the people, the rest that you love, and share the truth with them. And you'll be surprised what happens. You begin to love those you didn't like. I'm telling you, you will love those that you didn't like. And you'll be really frustrated with those who you love. <laughs> All right? That's how it works. You step into that, and there's great joy that comes. I feel it to this day when somebody, I, I get a chance to, to speak to at a deeper level of, with Christ and they make a decision to follow Christ, it does something to me. I could even say, God, this, this was about me, wasn't it? It wasn't even about him. You already had him. It was about me. You're finally getting it. That's what he's telling us. It's about us. It's really about him. Us happens when I, when I focus on him. And the same is true for you. Well, I got through about a third of the third that I was going to do. This is so rich. Read this again. And if you really want to believe what I said, read chapter 38 where it talks about Judah. And you'll be disgusted with him and you'll say, God used him too. All right. The worship team can come forward. What's that? Calling on Travis? Bo and Travis. You guys come on up here. I just want to say a couple things as I close this off. God is patient. His desire is that none would be lost. That's the heart of God. That all would come to repentance and know who Christ is and salvation would come to them. How do I know this? Because I looked at the calendar. Joseph received his dream 1898, 1900 years before Christ. He gets the dream. It's almost 4,000 years, not quite, from the time of Christ, I'm sorry, from that time to the time of, that we're in today, in the current year that we live, close to 4,000 years, and he's still waiting. For 2,000 of those years, it was about the church, right? It's about us, the believers, bringing in the Gentiles. And I believe it's coming, coming to an end, like I said before. And when he calls his church home, I believe that there's, in a really short period of time, that it's going to be all about the Jew. And the same thing that's happening with the Jew today, like Jews are coming to Christ today, not like they will when his focus is purely the Jew. And the Christians will come to Christ in that day and it'll be through greater tribulation than you can imagine. They will come to Christ. You don't want to get there that way. You want to get there because you made a decision for him today. Christians at that time are... are this is my, my words, and it's going to sound rude, but they're like the afterthought. The focus is the Jew at that day. But right now, the focus is on us, the church. 
and reaching out to the lost. And if you're sitting in here and you're lost, I'm gonna have people up here for praying. In fact, the people that are praying can come up now. Just come up and talk to them and say, hey, I'm not so sure about my faith. I kind of sit in the church pew and I don't really do anything. I don't feel anything. I don't, I never really made a decision for God. You come up and make a decision with them. They'll pray. They want to pray. They're hungry to pray for you. But for the whole group, I'll just speak to you right now. If you don't know him, just raise your hand and say, I want to know him. I want, I want him to be my savior. Is there anybody here? We all believers here? Raise your hand high if that's you. Okay. If it was too hard to do that, you come up here and tell these people, yeah, my leg hurts, I can't walk good. Oh yeah, I need Jesus. You can do that up with these guys. They're really good at it. They'll love you. Father God, it is in Jesus' name that I pray for each person in this room. Lord, you know all things. You know what we've been through as a church. You know what we're going through. And you know where we're going. Father, we're going with you. So we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you move us to the people, to the places, to the areas that you want us to be in to do what you've called us to do. Father, let our cry be, what can I do and how can I do it? Let that be our cry, our prayer to you. And then empower us to do the very thing you're calling us to do. I pray that in Jesus' name. Now bless each person here as they step closer to you each day. And Lord, as I, I'll just take a, a, a pivot here and I just, I do want to lift up Israel to you. Let us not grow weary in praying for our greatest ally, which is Israel. Let us not grow weary when the media comes at us like a torrent and a flood, but let it instead increase our, our uh, vigor to do what you've called us to do, which is to pray for this country. So we pray for the protection of Israel and we pray for the salvation of Israel, that they would know you as we know you. And even more, I pray that in Jesus' name.